Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank the organizers. I was supposed to give this talk yesterday. Family got in the way, so they were kind enough to move it to this morning. I apologize, because this is probably going to be a bit heavy for first thing on a Sunday morning. So you have me to blame, I'm afraid. So the talk today is entitled Redundant Oxygen Sensors, Theory and Heresy. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll think I'm a heretic, but we'll see. So the first off, let's just talk about what's meant by reliability. As far as I'm concerned, on a rebreather, a rebreather is reliable if you can complete the dive in closed circuit. There are other definitions, but that's the one I work with. All right, let's talk a little bit about probability, because this is what is at the core of reliability. We're going to talk about the following topics. Statistical independence, the probability of failure of a subsystem, such as oxygen measuring, the probability of failures of redundant systems, and then what happens when we get into the realms of conditional probability and not knowing if a system has actually failed. So throughout this talk, a couple of things, a basic statistical nomenclature. P is the probability of success, i.e. working. And Q, probability of failure, not working. And as standard in probability theory, P plus Q equals one. So this is the most important thing I want to get across to you. This is from Wikipedia. What do we mean by statistical independence? In probability theory, to say that two events are independent means that the occurrence of one event makes it neither more nor less probable that the other occurs. This is a fundamental concept in probability, and it tends to get glossed over, and I must say particularly gets glossed over when we start talking about diving. So first off, let's just consider a single non-redundant system. If we have statistical independence, a single system's overall reliability or probability of working is the product of its constituent components. So mathematically, we have that little equation there. And from that, it should be apparent that the probability of the system can never be greater than the probability of the least reliable component. Kind of obvious, right? Well, let's put some numbers to that. So what you'll see here on the top two lines is a system that consists of four components, one, two, three, and four, and I have put the probability of success of each of those components in the second row and converted that into failures per thousand trials. And so you can see this system on the far right-hand side, if I can get a pointer here. Dun, dun, dun. Over here. 106 failures per thousand trials. So what happens if we take the least reliable component, which is component one here, and we make it 10 times more reliable? That is, its failures per thousand trials has gone from 50 all the way down to five. You say, wow, that's a huge improvement. But look at the result on the overall system. It's only dropped from 106 to 64. So you've improved one component by an order of magnitude, but your system has only improved by a factor of two. I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a pretty bad return on investment. It gets even worse if you make the mistake of trying to improve the most reliable component. So in this case, we took the most reliable component and made it 10 times more reliable. And we've now gone from 106 failures per thousand down to 98. In other words, it was barely worth doing. And it's for this reason that people gravitate towards redundancy, because it's really hard to improve the intrinsic reliability of a system. OK, this is where you'll start thinking or well, wishing you hadn't had those beers last night. The first line, this is uh, the so-called Bernoulli trial equation. This tells you for independent systems, the probability of K systems working out of 10. Um, I won't bother you with all the notation. Here's the results you need to know. For N equals one, that is a non-redundant system, the probability of success 
is 1 minus Q, 1 minus the probability of failure. For n equals 2, it turns out to be 1 minus Q squared. n equals 3, 1 minus Q cubed. And if you can't work it out what it is for n equals 4, you're probably in the wrong place. So, you look at that and you go, well, that's pretty interesting. What does that mean in practice? So, let's put some numbers on it. So, sticking with my probability of failure of 0.9, uh, success of 0.95, for a single system, we end up with 500 failures per 10,000. We go to a redundant system, we come down to 25. That's a factor of 20 improvement. Now, that sounds pretty good. We go to a doubly redundant system, for instance, three oxygen sensors. Our probability of failure has dropped all the way down to 1.25. That is a factor of 400 improvement. Now, those are sorts of numbers that people get excited about. Okay? Unfortunately, in my opinion, they're complete garbage, as I'll now demonstrate. Just as an aside, if you run the numbers on redundant systems, let me just show you this. You've got three systems whose intrinsic reliability are 0 0.95, 0 0.99, and 0.995. If you make them redundant and look at the improvement factor on the bottom row here, you will see that the least reliable system only improved by a factor of 20, the next by a factor of 100, and the most reliable improved by a factor of 200. So I call this the redundancy conundrum. In effect, you get the biggest bang for your buck from redundancy when your system is already inherently very reliable. So if you think about what that means in terms of designing a rebreather, you design an incredibly reliable rebreather, and then you make it redundant. Are people prepared to pay for that when the system is already inherently highly reliable? The other way of looking at it is this to use a, an English expression, and I know there are a lot of English people in the room here, you can't make a silk purse out of a pig's ear, okay? Applying redundancy to a crap system gives you an improvement, but not as much as you think. All right. Here's the first problem. When it comes to oxygen sensors, they are incredibly statistically dependent. So let's talk about some of these things. The first one is, and this is under the diver's control, you put the same oxygen, oxygen sensors from the same manufacturing lot in your rebreather, they are no longer independent. If there is a manufacturing defect in that lot, you've had it. The second thing is, if you use sensors, you change all your sensors at the same time, they are undergoing a simultaneous aging. They are no longer independent. These are two things the diver can control. The third one, which Arne Sieber talked about yesterday, I believe, is the oxygen sensors all have a common abuse profile. And this is inherent in a rebreather. You can't escape it. So I think Arne talked about the temperature and humidity, shock, and these sorts of things. The next one is much more subtle. It's what I call the common environment. When you design a rebreather, you typically place the oxygen sensors in a location that is optimal for measuring the PO2. What that means is, though, is all the oxygen sensors are exposed to the same temperature, the same humidity, and the same shock profile. The next one, shared measurement system. Most rebreathers take those oxygen sensors, they feed them into the same set of electronics, the same analog to digital converters, the same voltage reference, the same software, the same microprocessor. And then the last one, which is my, I guess, favorite, is shared calibration gas. I seriously doubt if there's anyone here who has ever independently calibrated the oxygen sensors in their rebreather. Bottom line is the calibration gas is wrong. All three sensors are wrong. And you don't get a much better definition of statistically dependent than that. Okay? So oxygen sensors are not statistically depend independent. So what can we do about that? Well, there's something called Bayes' theorem in probability. It's called, um, it's related to conditional probability. What it comes down to is this, it says, what is the probability of X happening if Y has already happened? What that means is, if one oxygen sensor has already failed, is the probability that the second oxygen sensor has failed the same, greater, less, or whatever? So, 
my friend Bayes here came up with this nice little equation um, that I won't bore you with the details on, but just sort of show you some of the results. So let me take you through this. First off, we've got a system that fails Q percent of the time. And then a second system that fails R percent of the time that system one fails. You with me on that? So this guy's failed, and now this guy, the probability of him failing is now dependent on this guy. So what we end up with is the probability of both system one and system two failing at Q times R. Now if system one and system two are heterogeneous, that is essentially it's the same oxygen sensor, then you can rewrite, rewrite R to be S times Q, and you end up, at the bottom line, the probability of success of one minus S times Q squared, where S is greater than one. And this basically tells you the degree of statistical dependence in the system. If the system is statistically independent, S is one. If S is greater than one, you have statistical dependence. So let's put some numbers on that. So what I've done here, I've set R equals to 10. If you think it through, that is equivalent to saying if the first sensor has failed, the probability of the second sensor having failed is 50%. It's a toss-up at that point. Now, you may argue with that or not, but let me just look at the uh, impact on the numbers. An independent redundant system has 25 failures per 10,000. That is, if they're completely statistically independent. If they're dependent on each other, your failures have jumped 250 per 10,000 versus a single system that is only 500. In other words, this so-called redundant sensor here when it becomes statistically dependent, is crucifying your actual improvement in probability in, in, of, of working. I found these numbers a little bit sobering. And incidentally, if, as you change P and Q, the actual ratios and things change. And I'm not trying to suggest that oxygen sensors have a 5% failure rate, okay? Um, but I'm just using this to illustrate the impact on what people think is happening. The second huge problem we have with oxygen sensors is this. We can't tell when they failed. Okay? Now, in probability theory, you toss a coin, you get a head or a tail. There is nothing in probability theory that says the coin lands on its edge. We don't know whether it's a head or a tail. But with oxygen sensors, there is absolutely a third outcome, and that is don't know. That's pretty sobering. You've got an oxygen sensor, you don't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Now, let's see what this does. So with two out of three voting, that's the standard response. Well, if we don't know, we're going to vote. Two out of three. So I put some numbers up here. The first one, single system, as usual, 500 failures per 10,000. I go to a redundant system. 25 failures per 10,000. Looking good. Three oxygen sensors, 1.25 failures per 10,000. As soon as you apply a two out of three voting algorithm, guess what? Even if the sensors are statistically independent, you end up with 72 and a half failures per 10,000. In other words, you will notice that you are not even close to being as good as a true double sensor system if they're statistically independent. So the improvement factor in this case is a mere 6.9. So I hear people say, oh, I've got three oxygen sensors. And I say, yeah, with your voting algorithm in place, if everything is working perfectly, you haven't got a 500 factor improvement in reliability, you've got like seven. Personally, I find that scary. All right. I've been talking enough. It's time to get some uh, things going on here. All right, we're gonna have a vote. Your rebreather's got three oxygen sensors. One reads 0.4, one reads 1.0, one reads 1.3. Your set point is 1.0. What should the voting algorithm do? So I've offered you five choices here. The first one, Average all three together. The second one, 
get rid of the low guy, average the two high guys. The third one, throw out the outliers, take the middle one. Fourth one, get rid of the low guys, take the high guy. And the fifth guy, reject the high guys, take the low guy. Now I'd like you to all think about this because we're going to hold a vote here in the room in terms of what the system should do. And incidentally, not voting here is not an option, okay? This isn't a presidential election. Your life is on the line. You've got to make a decision here. So, okay, so average all three. Show of hands. Who would go for averaging all three? Oh. Well, okay, yeah, so, here, okay, so, obviously this is slightly artificial, but as I'm going to explain shortly, it's actually not that artificial. So let us just assume for the sake of argument that you are in a decompression situation, you're not sure you've got enough bailout gas, shame on you, but that's the, the, the reality, and so you have to stick on closed circuit. This is all the information you've got, okay? This, well, I mean, obviously you can say, well, I would, I would go with option, there's, there's a you know, sixth option or a seventh option or whatever, but I would suggest to you, if you think about it, if you're trying to program the microprocessor that's, that's running this algorithm, okay, what would you like that microprocessor to do? I mean, voting's easy, right? So... All right, let's go for it. Average all three. Come on, hands in the air so we can see. Stand up and be counted. Okay, handful that average all three, okay? Number two, reject the low guy, average the two high guys. Okay, good. Number three, take the middle one. Okay. All right. Number four, uh, reject the two low guys, take the high guy. No votes, one vote for that, okay. And number five, reject the high guys, take the low guy. Okay. Um, Richard, will you do me the honor of standing up, please? Um, I'm sure most of you know that, that's Richard Pyle. Richard just voted for option five, but he's got inside track information, okay. So, thanks, Rich. Okay, for those of you that took the three middle ones, I've got bad news really bad news and dreadful news, okay? The bad news is you're dead. The really bad news is if you're like any other diver I know, you've gone straight to hell. And the absolutely appalling news about this is when you get to hell, you're going to have to listen to this lecture over and over again. <laughs> So let me tell you about these numbers, okay? I didn't pull these out of thin air. These are actually real. These happened to Richard a number of years ago on a Mark V. The Mark V algorithm came along and did what most of you voted for, which was to reject 0.4 and average 1.0 and 1.3. If you uh, attended Richard's talk on Friday, he talked about the times when the Mark V rebreather made a decision that he disagreed with, and he proved to be right. Well, this was one of those cases. So what has happened here is, guess what? The first two sensors are statistically dependent. They are operating in unison. It is the third sensor that is actually reading correctly. Richard was suspicious. He hit a diluent blast across his oxygen sensors, and guess what? these two high ones suddenly started reading a hell of a lot lower. Now, notwithstanding the statistical independence issue of this, here's the other thing that I very rarely see discussed when it comes to rebreathers. We talk about hypoxia and hyperoxia as if they are twins. Each is equally bad. Well, they aren't. Because for me, if I was in a situation where it was a case of I have no idea if my oxygen sensors are reading correctly or not. Do I add oxygen 
and risk hyperoxia, or not add oxygen and risk hypoxia? Well, for me, it's a no-brainer. You know, I'll risk the hyperoxia any day because we all know that some people can tolerate very high PO2 levels for long periods. But I don't know anybody that can tolerate 0.05. Okay? So the bottom line is here, we've got three problems with oxygen sensors. Okay? Number one is they're not statistically independent. Number two is even if they are, and we don't know that they failed, the voting algorithm comes in and bites you hard. And thirdly, it's really hard to design a good voting algorithm. Okay? The bottom line is here, in many circumstances, 302 sensors are barely better than one. I appreciate that's a rather controversial position, okay? But you just want to wave your hands around and say, well, of course three are better. You have to explain away the statistical dependence, not knowing if they failed, and how the voting algorithm works. All right, so these incidents, like the one I've just described here, were a, a pretty big wake-up call for me, because I never bothered crunching the numbers. I just, just took it as an article of faith that three sensors were reliable. So, you know, when it came to the, uh, the Mark VI, um, we came up with an alternative paradigm, and it's sort of rather interesting. I mean, so I think most people are aware of how this thing works. What we try to do is constantly validate a single sensor during the dive. We have a backup, but it's a different paradigm, so it's not, this, the backup sensor does not enter into the measurement or control at all, unless we've determined that the primary sensor has failed. And this is an example of using technology coupled with training to minimize user error. Okay? I appreciate that's also a fairly controversial position, um, but uh, I'll be happy to defend it. So the way it works, basically, for those of you who don't know, we've designed the rebreather such that we can blow both diluent and oxygen independently across our primary sensor. We can monitor the sensor's response at any time but to do this, we also have to understand very well how the sensor changes with ambient conditions, aging, temperature, etc. Okay? Um, I won't lie to you, it's pretty damn hard. But here's what I like about it. First is, it allows genuine automatic calibration of the oxygen sensor. And what this means is, what we do on the Mark VI is, we take what you've told us is pure oxygen, or Actually, it doesn't have to be pure, but you've told us that this is oxygen with a certain fraction of oxygen in it. We calibrate the sensor against that. We then automatically inject the diluent across it. And if it doesn't come absolutely in where it should be, then one of two possibilities. You don't have oxygen, you don't have the diluent, you told us. Furthermore, because we're doing this in a highly controlled environment, there is no, you know, basically no ability for the user to screw up the calibration. The bottom line is, is that it takes out what I consider to be the most co important common mode failure across oxygen sensors. That is using the wrong calibration gas. The second point is, the, uh, I believe the Poseidon marketing thing talks about oxygen sensor validation. It's not actually oxygen sensor validation. What it's doing is checking that the FO2 of the validation gas, the depth sensor, and the oxygen sensor are consistent. If one of them is wrong, then you get the wrong answer. We can't actually tell you which one is wrong. We just know that there's a wrong answer. So the point is, it simultaneously validates three things that kill divers. Wrong gas, wrong depth reading, bad O2 sensor. So, quite interesting. Let me just give you a little anecdote. Uh, I was down here uh, a few months ago for DEMA, as I'm sure many of you were. Uh, we were having a meeting, and we got a call from the, the pool to tell us, hey, guess what? There's a problem with the rebreather. It's rejecting 
the calibration gas. What the hell? Well, this happened right at the end of the day. The, uh, the dive store that was doing the work had actually run out of air and just uh, slipped them some nitrox instead for the uh, diluent and didn't tell them. And the uh, Mark VI came back and said, this ain't right. Now, obviously, in a pool dive, not a big deal. Um, in other situations, it might well have been. The last thing, really, I want to take out of this, um, this came about effectively as a consequence of this design decision and not as a requirement. Uh, we have what we call hyperoxic linearity test. Right now, everyone calibrates their O2 sensors up to one bar and then proceeds to operate them above that point. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as being the height of lunacy. But we had no option. We sort of comfort ourselves that there's not a problem, because guess what? We've got these three oxygen sensors, remember? And if one of them's not responding properly, they're all going to vote out and life's going to be good. Yeah, well, we've already talked about that. And so, with this technology, what we can do is, as you get down to about six meters, we start hitting that oxygen sensor with pure O2. And we look at its response and make sure that the damn thing is linear beyond the operating point. And if it isn't, we let you know. And I'm sure if there are people in this room that have dived the rebreather, I've heard plenty of people bitching, oh, it wouldn't let me go above 1.0. It was like, yeah, well, because we couldn't guarantee that the sensor was working properly up there. Right now, everyone else is just an article of faith that it damn well works. So here's my summary. Unless you're damn careful, three oxygen sensors in a voting configuration are little better than a single sensor. As a diver, please make sure that your oxygen sensors don't come from the same lot. Don't change them at the same time. Okay, it's just basic common sense, really. All right, this alternative paradigm of voting does offer a lot of benefits that uh, I think people should think about. And uh, for me, uh, I have to tell you, when we we introduced the, the Mark VI at uh, DEMA, I guess four or five years ago, the uh, the message boards lit up with comments along the lines of, you know, basically Bill Stone has lost his marbles. Well. You back there, Bill, somewhere, wherever he is. Um, I can probably attest to whether Bill has lost his marbles or not, but I can tell you on that particular day he had not. Um, and this fundamentally is the theory behind that decision. That's it. Any questions?